So in the last episode I was talking about artificial intelligence and I want to pick up on one of the threads there. So in the video I equated predictability and intelligence. So the more predictable you are, the less intelligent you are. And that might have come across as odd. And I want to delve deeper into where that conception of intelligence comes from. In the video before that, you sh uh, maybe you can remember we were talking about the Hilbert program. Gödel and Turing proved that the Hilbert program was a bust. And the Hilbert program was ultimately a totalitarian uh, program to bring control to the whole of humanity. Now, particularly in the case of Alan Turing, when he invented the Turing machine to prove the Einscheidung's problem was actually unsolvable, it became the general purpose computer, and universal Turing machine is the proper name for it, and it is the common computer that you know today. And in essence, everybody ignored Gödel and Turing's results and pushed on with the invention that Turing had come up with to prove that Hilbert's program was untenable. So it's almost as if the world went ahead with Hilbert's program, ignoring the fact that it was actually a wild goose chase. So where do I get the idea that predictability is related to intelligence? Well, it comes from cybernetics. Where this all went uh, during the war and afterwards was particularly into control systems and into cybernetics. And so we pick up the story with somebody called Norbert Wiener. Now Norbert Wiener wrote a book called Cybernetics. He was the inventor of the frame cybernetics and from that we get cyborg and cyberspace and everything that has cyber in it comes from cybernetics and a book he wrote called uh, Cybernetics in, in 1950. Now, Norbert Wiener has probably written one of the most important documents of the 20th century. The important work that he did was called The Human Use of Human Beings. In that book, he promoted the idea of using cybernetics, artificial intelligence and machines uh, to make life better for human human beings, to make life uh, less less full of drudgery, to free people up so they could do intellectual pursuits like art and the pursuit of knowledge. But he did realize, Norbert Wiener realized, that there was a danger in robotics, artificial intelligence, and cybernetics. And he kind of foresaw the Wally movie uh, where, we, where we became too reliant on essentially automation. And he also saw the problem of the Elon Musk and uh, Stephen Hawking thing that we talked about in the previous video and that was the, the rise of the robots. So let me just read something that he said in that book which is kind of seminal. These machines must be used for the benefit of man for increasing his leisure and enriching his spiritual life rather than merely for profits and the worship of the machine as a new brazen calf. So bad like there we have actually started to worship our machines as brazen calves. So Norbert Wiener was the founder of cybernetics, and the word cyber comes from the Greek kybernon, to, to steer or pilot a ship. So one of the viewers on these videos came out and said, Hugh, who's steering the ship while you're actually doing these videos? And the answer is, it's an autopilot. It is quite literally an automatic helmsman, the very definition of the word kybernaut. So this idea to steer or control is essential to machines, robotics and kybernetics. And it became a central theme of the 20th century and it continues to this day. And at the heart of it is totalitarianism. 
it's the idea to first control machines and then it spills over to viewing the human as a, a Cartesian, say, uh, automaton freed from nature and an individual and then also controlling that atom, that atomized human that can then be controlled by a machine. So in the 20th century, particularly in in uh, post-humanism and cybernautics, there becomes a merging of man and machine. The view of becomes uh, of the brain as mechanized, as the human being as mechanized, and there is the totalitarian desire to control particularly things like violence. And you start getting all these programs in the CIA, these secret programs, uh, to control people, to electrically stimulate them, to use them like robots. In 1953, this series of therapeutic research experiments was conducted by Dr. Robert Heath of Tulane University. His subjects responded to electrical stimulation of isolated brain centers implanted with electrodes. I just feel like I don't have any thoughts like a human being. I'm just an animal walking around on the earth. Who quickly learned that they could mitigate pain or induce a deep-seated pleasure or even sexual arousal with the push of a button. Find this button that that's number two button. Most pleasurable. Mm -hmm. how, how do you feel? You're trying to tell me how it excites you, is that it? No, I think it's someone on the sexy button. So really that's the destiny of what's going to happen if Elon Musk and these complete psychopaths actually carry on forward with putting electrodes in people's brains. This was where we were going in the 1950s, but we kind of saw sanity by the end of the century, and now we're lapsing back into the insanity again. Of course, Elon Musk uh, will sell the idea of, well, you have a brain-computer interface, and that's why the electrodes are put in your head, so that you can communicate on the Internet, and you can be a superhuman being, you can be more intelligent, you can be richer, you can beat out your fellow man, just stick these electrodes in your brain. But of course, where it's actually going to go is not you controlling the world in a computer. Basically, they're going to control your brain through the Internet. So I wonder if, by the time Norbert Wiener died in 1964, he had started to realize that the field that he launched, cybernetics, had actually got onto the dystopian path that he warned against, the path that we are on today of over-reliance on automation, AI, and cybernetics, and the worship of it, the mindless worship of our technology. He wrote a book in 1964 called God and Golem, Inc. Uh, Golem, of course, is from Jewish folklore. It's an anthropomorphic being created out of inanimate matter that then Pinocchio-like takes on a life of its own and runs rampant. In the book uh, God and Golem, Inc., Norbert Wiener says, The future offers very little hope for those who expect that our new mechanical slaves will offer us a world in which we may rest from thinking. Help us they may, but at the cost of supreme demands upon our honesty and our intelligence. So it looks like we have not been up to the supreme demands and honesty placed on our intelligence. Now, in the previous video, I made a kind of comparison to intelligence and predictability and you may have picked up on that and found it a bit strange because I think most people think intelligence is oh you can do amazing calculations or you have uh, you have a ability to cognize things uh, better than say somebody else or faster so where does the idea come from that basically predictability uh, is an indication of stupidity in essence a very important question in this age of very, very predictable people. And don't forget, the authoritarian yen to control is also a yen to make people predictable. In other words, to make people stupid. Now, going back to this idea that predictability means stupidity is worth going into in, in some depth. So let's start with an important name in cybernetics, and that's Ross Ashby. Now the word machine comes from the Proto-Indo-European Aryan for mag -ana. It means to have power or to enable, to grant power to, in other words. 
When you see a machine for the first time, you'd probably ask, what does it do? But Ashby said the proper question to ask is, what states can it possibly have? And those states are called variety. The cybernetics term for the number of states a machine can have is the variety the machine can have. So Ashby coined this term variety and it becomes almost a synonym for intelligence in uh, machine states. Now this might seem a little bit odd and artificial to you, but it's pure alien cortex. You see, somewhere within the idea that variety equals intelligence, you must kind of imagine the alien cortex perspective, because what the alien cortex is looking to control it is a machine for competition and for dominance. So, in other words, it's like a chess player or a battlefield general. It's trying to, it has a clear conception of the enemy or the opponent, and it tries to outmaneuver the opponent. So all this martial, militaristic kind of thinking, this alien cortex thinking of dominance and control, is part of cybernetics. The cybernetics is the art of control. First of machines and then viewing a human as a machine so that you know, basically the alien cortex can control other alien cortexes and reduce its own anxiety levels. And so that's a, an important part of understanding variety. So you can imagine it in terms of a competition. Now, going back to the war, almost immediately the, after Alan Turing's paper in 1936, we went into the war and the computer was used. Uh, very first uses of the computer were things like fire control, artillery fire control for ships at sea, basically shooting planes, anti-aircraft artillery shooting at bomber squadrons, and then of course cryptography, which is what uh, Alan Turing is is well known for and the decryption of the Enigma machine. So there again the Enigma machine if you saw the movie with Alan Turing uh, then the Enigma machine is a neural net it's just like the picture that I drew previously in the previous video and decryption is purely trying to understand the neural net just figure out how it's wired and then basically you can understand the inputs and get the correct outputs through that neural net. The, the Enigma machine is best seen in, in that way. So now let's go to fire control and think about why variety is important. It's really game theoretic and it's leading close into Nash and uh, game theory. But the idea is you have an opponent that you have to outsmart. So let's go and think of it in terms of artillery and look closer to one of the first uses that a computer was put to during the war. If the gun is aimed directly at the planes at the time the shell is fired, the formation will have moved on almost two miles before the shell reaches their altitude. That's why a gunner always leads his target, like a hunter firing at ducks in flight. The hunter must judge his lead and aim ahead of the duck, if he is to hit it. So if the pilot is predictable, in other words, pre, before, dictum, say, in other words, you can say in advance what the pilot is going to do or where he's going to be, then you can take a lead on him and you can shoot him down. He's a dead duck. Whether tracked by optical sight or by radar, the information is fed by electric cable to a director. This mechanical quiz kid digests the data and automatically computes the right lead, setting the guns. So they will fire not at where the target is now, but at where it will be at the end of the shell's time of flight. The director will then go on automatically adjusting and setting the guns as long as the planes remain in range. The gunner is up against his greatest weakness, prediction. His firing data can never be more than the assumed future course of the target. So how does the pilot respond to this? Continuing your present flight path for 35 seconds would place you right at the predicted point. But making a change after 25 seconds leaves the flak bursting on a course you're no longer flying. You can see from this that if you knew when to make changes and what changes to make, you could continuously defeat the predictions. So obviously the more random and unpredictable a pilot can be, the better. And the same goes for the Atlantic convoys and ships and submarines. 
During World War II, Britain needed millions of tons of goods imported every year just in order to survive. Since invasion was out of the question, the next best option for Germany was to starve Britain by destroying their naval supply lines. I'm here in the Atlantic port of La Rochelle in France. This is the bunker bar where German submariners spent time in between their sorties out into the Atlantic to attack the Atlantic convoys. Now the same thing applied for ships at sea, trying to avoid submarines' torpedoes. The submarine commander, or U-boat commander, would have to get a lead on one of the, say, merchantmen in the Atlantic convoys so that the torpedo would arrive at exactly the same spot as the ship in order to, to detonate. So in the Atlantic convoys they had an elaborate system of zigzagging, uh, never knowing that there might be a U-boat taking aim on them, they would zigzag across the Atlantic. And the timing of these zigzags, obviously it had to be choreographed so every ship in the convoy made exactly the same turn at the same time. And these were worked out in advance. So each helmsman in an Atlantic convoy would have a schedule of exact turns and exact timing that had to be timed very precisely with a stopwatch. Of course, if a U-boat commander happened to get hold of one of these schedules of turns, then he could basically just predict where the ships were going to be and hit them every time. So the question becomes, how do you formulate a proper zigzag strategy? Obviously, it's a question of being random. But what does random mean? It seems like everybody knows what random means. It just means haphazard. But it turns out it's very, very difficult to nail down what randomness really is. So for example in the case of a bomber, the gunners know what the bomb target is. So they can put up a barrage flak right in front of the target. In planning what kind of changes to make, we must avoid ineffective evasion. Do not fly a sinuous course illustrated here. Because such small regular variations can be averaged out. Even a constantly curving course must not be maintained for too many seconds at your altitude because the newer directors can predict on such a curve. Consider the overall pattern of an evasive course in the sky. You can see that nervous minor changes are worthless. Instead, compromising between what confuses gunners the most and upsets your formation the least, we plan this sort of evasive action. There's only so much maneuvering that a pilot can do. At some point, there is some mutual knowledge between the gunner and the pilot, and that's which, what the target is. So there is a point of certainty and a point of uncertainty that converges on that certainty. So I would characterize that and coin a neologism which is crypto-random. So what I mean by crypto-random is it's not entirely random. Say for example the Atlantic convoys. The U-boat commanders knew exactly where they were headed for. They knew that they had to get to England. So they could zigzag a certain amount around the sea, but they couldn't zigzag forever till they ran out of fuel. There is some neutral knowledge and that's where they eventually headed for. So really, it's a bounded randomness. You have only so much fuel, so you can't meander and zigzag around the entire Atlantic Ocean completely haphazardly. You have a destination to get to, and you don't want to spend too much time at sea. So you have a bounded randomness. It's the least time you can spend in the Atlantic by being erratic as you can within that time, making sure you get to the destination. So crypto-randomness is the key. It's not completely insane, it's secretly insane. So what is the difference between crazy like a madman and crazy like a fox? If we try and generate a sequence of random numbers just straight out of our heads, it turns out that people are not very good at that. Ironically, they don't put enough redundancy in it. They don't put enough repeats in it. They get too much into a predictable uh, alteration of heads and tails. It's very difficult to generate a random number off the top of your head. So obviously completely random is crazy like a madman. To be crypto-random, you have to have some secret way of generating randomness. How do you go about that? 
because no one really knows what random is. Because when you really get into it and ask what is randomness, it means unpredictability, but how do you know if something's random or not? If I give you, say, a long sequence of heads or zeros, say, you would say automatically, no, that's not random because it's just a long repetition. But in an infinitely long random number, you should have infinitely long sections that are repetitious. So you should have infinitely long one sequences and zero sequences. A famous mathematician called Gregory Chaitin said that you can only know randomness from its source. And to date, really the only truly sources of random information is things like quantum decay and atmospheric noise, just natural sources. It's very difficult to get something that is computably random. So in other words, take this example. Now, going back to World War I and World War II and the zigzagging ships, they had to come up with schemes for how to generate these random patterns. Now, as it turned out, they zigzagged, ships zigzagged during World War I and World War II. But in World War I, they just had to work out whether it was actually a good tactic or not on paper. And as it happened, it looked like it wasn't a good tactic. The reason was that for a submarine to hit a ship, ideally the torpedo should hit it at 90 degrees in the side. And if you think about a ship going at, say, 8 knots and a torpedo doing about 40 knots, it meant that there was a definite V that the submarine had to launch its torpedo in. So a V ahead of the ship, it had to be ahead of the ship, uh, lined slightly ahead, um, but within a definite V where it could actually make the hit. Now what they concluded was, as the ship went faster, the V narrowed. And it looked like the best thing would be just to race across the Atlantic as fast as possible with the narrowest V. In the end, they did zigzag, because what they realized intuitively was that it was very difficult to get um, a bead on the ship through a periscope and it took a long time for the submarine commander to actually do the calculation and set it up. So they knew intuitively that it was probably better to zigzag and that's what they did. But by the time they got to World War II, they had computers that could actually prove that it was the better tactic. But then it becomes, how do you actually generate a sequence of random numbers that can't be predicted? So take, for example, say, the Admiralty or a ship uh, commander set on a scheme. Say you'd take the digits of pi. He'd say, just run through the digits of pi, which is fairly random. And if it's an odd number that comes up, then you zig left. If it's an even number, you zig right and you just carry on uh, working out a scheme like that. Well, it works great, till the U-boat commanders figured out you're using Pi. Then they'd get you every time. So this is all kind of a predator-prey scenario. And nature also has this problem with predators and prey. So, for example, if you take the cicada beetle, the cicada beetle has worked out a scheme whereby each generation gets propagated on a prime number year. The reason is that it's very easy for predators and biological processes to have an even number of sequences. So in other words, if uh, the cicadas came out on mass, say every other year, then it's very easy for a circadian clock in one of the predators to pick up on that cyclic rhythm, which is, you know, two, four, six, eight. So what the Sakaras have evolved is amazing ability for nature to pick out prime numbers. Big, noisy, and numerous, cicadas are set to emerge again from their unusually long reproductive cycle. The ones coming out of the ground this summer were conceived in 1999. Those particular cicadas incubated for 17 years. Not all cicadas have a prime number life cycle but there are species that have 13 and 17 year life cycles. The cicadas in the background on this video have a one year life cycle. Now if a ship commander used a similar pattern, there's always the possibility 
that the U-boat commander can figure out what that is, what the mechanism the commander is using to generate what I'll call now a pseudo-random sequence. So pseudo-randomness means fake randomness. And if you can figure out how the randomness was generated, then basically it's no longer random. Don't forget, in the competitive realm, the alien cortex version of this kind of competition, it's really a question of control. It's who's going to control who. Whoever can pre predict somebody else can be the predator. And whoever's predictable becomes the prey. Now, this is a very important point because of our totalitarian society and uh, because of the predator-prey relationships that are set up in our capitalist system, for example. It is a competitive system and it implies that whoever can be the more random uh, actually wins. Whoever actually turns out to be predictable can be exploited, can be controlled, uh, can be used as a resource. Basically, the predator can become a parasite. And that's what's happened in our capitalist system. So don't be fooled by the uh, employer-employee relationship. It's a relationship of exploitation. And the reason why your boss wants you to come to work on time, to have regular habits uh, that grades you on regularity, is because if you're not predictable, then you're not controllable. And if you're not controllable, then the parasite can't actually make a living out of you. As I've said in previous videos, it's very difficult to make a living out of a random number generator. That's why casinos don't even try. They just bias the machines in their favor to make sure that they're not random. They just appear random, uh, they pseudo-random, and it's possible to figure out what the algorithm is, in which case you could take a casino to the cleaners. So going right back to the beginning of the Industrial Revolution in England, then it all started really with the weavers and uh, the cotton gins. But the relationship that the cotton merchants had with the weavers was uh, one of uh, really cooperation. So uh, the, what the merchants used to do was they used to get uh, bales of cotton. They would give it to the weavers who lived in cottages. Those cottages, by the way, now you have to be a multimillionaire to afford. Uh, but the, uh, the weavers would then weave the cotton before market day on Saturday, give it back to the merchants, and the merchants would take it to market. Now, as it turned out, the merchants were uh, really upset that they felt that the weavers were actually exploiting them in a way. Because the weavers would lay about drinking, having fun all week, and then comes Friday, the whole family would get together and they would all weave like crazy so they, they would have uh, basically their assignment completed so they could give it uh, to the weaver. So that was one thing that the weaver didn't like was the, they weren't maximizing their time and effort for him. Uh, and then the, the other thing was that they always would hold a little over. So they would hold a little bit of the cotton over, weave it for themselves, and make their own linen take it to market and in essence be in competition with the cotton merchant that was actually trying to get them to just do the weaving for him. So this drove the cotton merchants mad. Eventually they solved the problem by putting the weavers in mills. The very start of the Industrial Revolution is the dark satanic mills where these uh, weavers were put to work uh, long hours, 12 or 14 hour days, six days a week uh, no longer working out of their little idyllic cottages. Uh, they were put under artificial light, and that's really where our artificial light comes from, is trying to extend the time that uh, weavers could work in a dark satanic mill, is what they were called, even in those times. Now, a very interesting thing about this is that it actually wasn't cost-effective for the cotton merchants. So don't let anybody tell you that capitalism is about cost-efficiency because at the very onset of this type of capitalist exploitation and the invention of the job and the wage, the salary, this is where people became wage slaves in these cotton mills, uh, is the amazing thing is that it wasn't economical for the cotton merchants. Can you imagine that? The doyen of capitalism, profit and efficiency, they were prepared to do something emotional 
and irrational and it cost them but they just couldn't bear the thought of the weavers being free so irrational as it was cost ineffective as it was they preferred them to be suffering in a mill rather than be free even though that would be actually the better economic situation so by pure psychology of vindictive spite capitalism was born now the mechanization that would eventually turn into cybernetics started in those mills essentially with uh, the jacquard loom in particular the point of the jacquard loom was it was an automated loom that worked off punch cards so what was the point of the jacquard loom and having punch cards controlling this weaving machine why not just rely on the weavers? It seems like it's more expense and it doesn't seem like it's cost effective. Well, once again, it's because of control. So with the Jacquard loom and with punch cards, in essence, the first prototype of a computer, the cotton merchants found that they had more control. So they were prepared to shell out for that expense and have that control because it meant that there were less mistakes, particularly if the cloth required a complex pattern. So in other words, the output from the cotton gin was more predictable. So predictable again equals control. So what's the secret to control? What's the essence of me as a capitalist boss exploiting you as a wage slave? How do I get control of you? What's the secret? behind the mystery of control. And here we go straight back to cybernetics, which was essentially this problem. And that's why Norbert Wiener's seminal work was called The Human Use of Humans. So what's the basics of, say, me being more intelligent than you and getting control of you, say, or you getting control of me? Well, going back to Ashby, and the variety, if you remember, Ashby claimed that for one system to control another, it must have a bigger variety than the system being controlled. He phrased it in terms of variety beats variety. So back to the fire control systems and anti-aircraft fire, whoever could be the most random would win. But obviously, then we get into the problem of randomness again. What exactly is random? Completely random like a madman is not any use to anybody. So it's how do you be crazy like a fox? And the answer is a certain type of variety. And that's what they started to experiment with. Now the first group that became very, very important was a group that Norbert Wiener was a member of and that's called the Macy Foundation. The Macy Foundation really shaped much of the automated world today. Everything that Elon Musk is doing is really uh, was generated from the Macy Foundation. It's not really known much out of cybernetics, but its impact was very, very broad. The members of the Macy Foundation, uh, funded by money that came from uh, the Rockefeller Institute, the members were a very broad and diverse bunch. Uh, they included people like Margaret Mead, who was a famous anthropologist. Some people have called her the most famous woman of the 20th century. It included neurologists, it included mathematicians. It had such a broad range that the work in the Macy Foundation, some of it's still classified, but it filtered into many, many branches in the social sciences, sciences as well as the hard sciences and into control systems and robotics um, that then uh, became so important in later really horrendous uh, experimentation done by say the CIA and MKUltra that became uh, Cold War efforts done inside the Soviet Union but primarily in the US uh, to control the minds of people to in essence turn them into automatons. Now as I say the very first principle of doing that is having a bigger variety. So if the uh, exploiter can come up with a bigger variety of behaviors than the exploited, then in general they can control them. Uh, that's the first principle. Now the next thing in the Macy Foundation, uh, the cyberneticists, let's call them, they were uh, rather obsessed by feedback. So again, uh, your boss at work will come and 
very keen on having little one-on-ones and giving you feedback. Uh, that's basically a control mechanism. So now the essence of feedback is not as much as you'd think. It's not so much uh, exploiting people by a top-down control. So it's not a top-down control system. It's an internal control system. So it has essence of self-governing. So really, uh, when your boss does uh, one-on-one to give you feedback, positive and negative, it's really uh, controlling you, training you by giving you a mirror, and then you comply with uh, with that. Uh, and you, it's what's uh, what's assumed is you don't game what the the manager is telling you in in say an employee review where they give you feedback. And the same implies in a machine. The machine is supposed to take uh, the feedback mechanism and respond to it in a stimulus response manner so that it becomes a goal-oriented system but its goal is oriented towards the control system so in other words you do what your boss's goal is uh, you don't game the system or the employee employer relationship to achieve your own goal which is what the weavers were doing to the cotton merchants so this was all formalized in what's been called Ashby's Law of Requisite Variety. And let me read it to you. So it says in essence, if a system is to be stable, the number of states of its control mechanism must be greater than or equal to the number of states in the system being controlled. Ashby states the law as variety can destroy variety. So variety destroys variety is uh, a crucial insight into exploitative relationships and into authoritarianism. If you wondered why your teacher in school uh, told you to quieten down and stop making so much noise, it's because really variety is noise. It's uh, randomness. So it's noise in terms of a signal. And the teacher wants to dominate. Uh, she wants to control the signal and that's what a classroom is about is a controlled input of a signal coming from the teacher to the pupil and so if the pupils making a noise they make in more variety uh, they make in more signals than the teacher in other words they're in control so the teacher asks the class to quieten down uh, so that they can control the signal and this is a crucial part of cybernetics and machine control and basic robotics. Don't lose track of the thread here. It all goes back to the Hilbert program. You remember? The ultimate totalitarian control by mathematicians of everything, including biology. Now biology and mathematics met in cybernetics. And one of the key players is Alan Turing. People remember his contribution to the computer and remember his work at Bletchley Park in, in decoding the Enigma, but they don't know much about the later Alan Turing after the war. And Alan Turing was really interested in biology and the evolution of biological systems, especially when it came to maths. He had this view that biology was really mathematical. He had the view that embryogenesis and morphology was based on mathematics. He actually programmed computers to do these kind of uh, regenerative uh, feedback programs that turned into dappled systems like patterns you might get on a cow or camouflage patterns, things that generated stripes, uh, say a, a zebra stripes, from, from very simple algorithms that generated much of these patterns that you commonly see in nature, including things like Fibonacci and Phi. Now this fitted in very well with the cybernetic program of control and ultimately control of biology and uh, the ultimate biological organism they're trying to control is a mammal and in a, one particular mammal and that's mankind. So underneath the Hilbert program is ultimate control of your fellow man. Now, Turing himself wasn't actually a member of the Macy Foundation, although he had close contact with the people that belonged to that foundation. There was a corresponding uh, British group called the Ratio Club, and Turing was a member of the Ratio Club. Before the cyberneticists, psychology's dominant paradigm was mainly behaviorism, kind of Pavlovian responses. 
and a real reluctance to look inside the black box of the mind. After the cyberneticists, the mind became central, but they viewed it as a machine. As things progressed, the more the mind became equitable with signal processing. Alan Turing published a paper in Nature that asked the question, can a human being be transmitted through a wire? And the answer he came up with was yes. The idea that a human being can be transmitted down a wire is actually correct if you think of a human being as just a genome. The information in your genome can be sent down a wire. You can get a cheek swab, send it off to 23andMe to have your DNA sequenced, and the resulting file is only a few meg. It can be transmitted on the internet. And that's increasingly how they came to perceive a human being as just a collection of information. And particularly the mind is, in essence, just signals. So it could be analyzed and controlled with signal processing. Now bear in mind that this is before Watson and Crick had actually discovered the structure of DNA. And it is a tribute to the cyberneticists that when Crick and Watson made their discovery, they immediately saw the nucleotide bases and uh, the sequence of amino acids as pure information. They saw immediately that it was a book to be read. It was a code for a human being and as such could be sent down a wire. Now earlier people like Heisenberg had written a book called What is Life and he had speculated that the nucleic acid was really just an aperiodic crystal. So when the structure of DNA was discovered, it was possible that it was just viewed as chemistry and biochemistry, and it remained quite a mystery. But because of the cyberneticist's emphasis on biology as information, it was immediately seen for what it is. It's basically a code for a human being. It's basically a book to be read, and they could see it as nature's way of encoding information. So with the biological book of life being considered just information, with the human mind being considered just a machine processing signals, we were all set for a revolution in social engineering and control of human beings. So if you don't want to be socially engineered, if you don't want to be controlled, if you don't want to live in a totalitarian society, then it's your duty to increase your variety, increase your intelligence, increase your creativity, increase your unpredictability. Or you could just turn yourself into a human robot slave. You're not a robot.